appreciate it, bro. You know, um, worked the hard 72 hours last week, you know. No doubt, no doubt. How you been? How you been? How you feeling? Yo, man, I'm here, man. It's long. It's long. Praise you know? Allah. Well, I gave you the strength to make it down, so, you know, we're going to get right to work. Um, so, um, I decided to do this demonstration um, based on a dialogue that uh, I, I was having between the, uh, myself and a sister on a video I had previously done. I thought it would be an um, excellent educational opportunity to kind of address her comments because, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm working a lot and I got my classes and a lot of things are going on. I didn't have an opportunity to respond back to the sister's um, comments um, three weeks ago. So I figured we just devote this particular session to, because um, it's, all, it's all relative. You know, she wasn't talking about um, non-related <coughs> topics. So we'll, we'll, we'll go into what um, was discussed and the video was called the Laws That Freed Us Part 2, and that was pub published on September 1st, it's 2019. Long. And the sister had uh, replied like three weeks ago. So, um, so let's get started. So the sister's name is uh, Jackie Archer. I hope the sister's watching. It's long, more biters. It's long. Um, it's long. And she had uh, created an interesting post. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read her words. I'm going to read my words, and I'm going to kind of give commentary on my perspective on the dialogue and you know my understanding. So she says, uh, with all due respect, there was oh wait, no, I think is that the first one or the last one? I was gonna make the beginning of the one, but uh, okay, no, I think that was the first one. So she said, uh, with all due respect, there was a coup, meaning like an overthrow. When Benjamin Franklin registered the United registered, I guess he went to the United States in France, and ran Lincoln under that United States. That was not the Missouri government, and there have been several United States after that one. They would go bankrupt, and another one would be started up and registered. The United States that's in operation is not the Missouri government. Now, um, we've heard this perspective, you know many times in the past uh, by Moore. This is, a, this is um, what I would consider a school of thought um, outside of a conventional uh, Moore's paradigm uh, founded by the Prophet Muhammad Ali. But I, I'm going to read my response and then um, I'm going to kind of elaborate on what I meant in my response. We're going to read her next response. So, she sa so it says, um, I say, his long sister Jackie Archer this is Sheikh Amir El, I'm the man demonstrating in this video. In terms of jurisprudence and constitutional law, the United States of America is a sovereign nation founded in the late 1700s. The Constitution is a founding document that is the supreme law of the land, Article 6. Now remember Article 6, it's going to be very important. I referenced Article 6, but it's going to be very important to what I'm going to explain to Sister Archer to make this all clear. And there is no way, way that one man can give away the sovereignty of the United States according to the Constitution. So let me let me elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, Mo, you got your Constitution on here? So what do I mean? Um, okay. What do I mean by um, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land? Am I just making that up, or is that somewhere within the Constitution? So there's a thing, this is long, Chief. There's a thing within the um, Constitution known as the Supremacy Clause. If I could just, this is the right article. So this article is right here. Let me get that. So Article 6. So could you read that clause? This Constitution and laws of the United States, which shall be made in pursuance thereof. Okay, so stop right there. This law, this, well, read that one more time. This Constitution and the laws of the United States. So stop right there. This Constitution is referencing the seven organic articles that was voted on in the, in the, in the um, Constitutional Convention. 
that was signed off by the 50 or so signers that represented um represented the uh, the, the, the 13 colonies to form the union. All right, and it says and, and it says in the laws of the United States. So that means any laws that was passed through what? How how are laws passed in the United States? Through the legislative branch, through the Congress. That's the Congress right. is the ones who pass laws. So these laws, so it's the Constitution, that's one one facet or one form of law. De jure law, according to the United States of America. One form. The second form is laws passed by the legislature. Mm -hmm. Y'all following me so far? Yes, sir. Can you read that? Let's read the next part of the list. It shall be made in pursuance thereof. This is very important. You know, um, in my, in my, uh, one of my constitutional law classes, this particular portion of the clause is explained to me in pursuit, that, that is made in pursuance thereof, meaning that any laws that are passed by the Congress have to be in continuity with the, con the, the Constitution, with the, with the pre-existing laws, the Constitution. Now can we continue? And all treaties made, or which shall be made, we stop right there. So that's another form of the jure law. All treaties made or which shall be made. Now the term treaties is something very popular within the Moorish community. Mm -hmm. that's right? right? The that's treaty right. of peace and friendship. That's right. Right? So if you're claiming to be a Moorish American, if you're claiming to be a, a Moor, descendant of the Moorish Empire, et cetera, et cetera, who was the first to recognize the United States of America as a government? Morocco. It was Morocco. It was the Moors who was the first nation on planet Earth That's to right. recognize the United States of America. It's so long. what does that tell us? It tells us that the Moors were the first to acknowledge the sovereignty of the United States of America. It's Fast long. forward in 2019 because of the era of slavery and the bitterness and the anger and, and the coming to knowledge and the, the brand of Negro, Black, and Color and all these things have culminated in it's such a resentment that now Moors, who are just coming to knowledge of themselves, are not honoring the treaty of their forefathers. Mm -hmm. They're now trying to delegitimize the sovereignty of the United States of America. Teach them, huh? But, you know, that's like, you know, the whole concept of, you know, no pun intended, Indian giving. Like, you know, more, hmm. Indian is just a, a misnomer for more. But you can't give something and try to take it back. Once that's the sovereignty smart. is recognized, you can't say you're no longer sovereign no more. That would... That would actually conflict with the idea of sovereignty. That's right. Meaning you, you the supreme power of, 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 over yourself, or your people, or your, your territory, or your land. You don't have to ask permission to continue being sovereign. It's not a status that can be stripped from you without, you know, being defeated in war. That's right. Or, or you know, willingly giving it up. That's right. All right, so can we continue with Article 6? Or which shall be made under the, the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. Okay, under the authority of the United States. So all of these forms of laws, all of these various aspects of law are all de jure laws according to the Constitution of the United States of America and are the supreme law of the land. That's right. Wow. That's right. Okay? There's no greater law than those laws referenced that we just heard the, the, the more breakdown, the brother breakdown. That's right. Wow. All right, so... Outside of that, you don't have the jury law. So mm -hmm. that portion that he read in pursuance thereof, see, that's the conflict that a moral would have that's on a prophet's path. Is if Congress passes a law that's not made in pursuance thereof of the Constitution, a law that violates the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Because as we're going to see in a second when the law reads, that that um violating that, violating any aspect of, of, of the supremacy clause. You're in violation of the Constitution. The law can't stand. So let, let, let the law continue so we can, we can get to that part. And the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. All right, so that, bound, that binds the judicial branch. All, all, state, all state judges, they have to rule in accordance with, with the su supreme law of the land. They can't, they can't supersede it. They can't overcome it. They can't, um, you know, make it into anything other than then, um, you know, something that's in, in, in accordance with the Constitution. All right, um, continue, Mo. So the judges are bound. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state 
to the contrary notwithstanding. Anything in the Constitution. So again, all of those elements that he just read are components or aspects of the Constitution. Anything within the Constitution itself, the construct of the Constitution, or any laws that are passed, they're notwithstanding. So you can't just do whatever you want to do. That's right. It's not like, you know, this is some type of monarchy or dictatorship where a king can come into place and it changes changes name tomorrow. This is a republic. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm working, huh? That, that, was, that was in there, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So article, so when I'm referencing article six, it's, it's, it, it's, in, it's in response to the claim that Benjamin Franklin registered the United States and France. I just wanna make sure. And I, so my statement, I said that there's no way that one man can give away the sovereignty of the United States, of, United States according to the Constitution. Mm-hmm. Who's the most powerful man in the United States of America at any given time? It's the president. Yeah, it's the president. president. So, the president, if anybody has the power, if any one man has the power to give away the sovereignty of the United States of America, mm-hmm. then it will be the president of the United States of America. It's not. Quick history uh, quiz. Was Benjamin Franklin mm-hmm. ever the president mm-hmm. of the United States of America? No. No, he wasn't. Does anybody know what role that he held that would have that would have that would coincide with her suggestion that Benjamin Franklin registered the United States and France? Uh, we're going to get to that right now. We're going to talk about Benjamin Franklin's role. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh. Thank you. All right. So, again, I, I did some research on the claim that um, I did some research on the claim that Franklin, Benjamin Franklin registered the United States and France. I didn't find any information on that. No, no um, primary sources, no articles, no scholarly journals, like, like no historical text or anything like that. But let's suppose, you know, just for the sake of argument. So Benjamin Franklin was a minister plenipotentiary to France. And then he eventually became the ambassador to France. He was the he was the ambassador. So his job was to do negotiations with France. But let's look at the Constitution, though, because does the Constitution give ambassadorial power to anyone? No, no, no. It does not. Ambassador is mentioned in the Constitution, but consequently, it's mentioned in Article Two. What's Article Two about? The executive branch, it's long, exactly. So let's take a look at Article 2. Because, see, the president has a number of powers that are outlined in the Constitution. And one of those powers is the, the capacity of the president to negotiate treaties. I, w- I want to make this real clear because you know, this is, a, this is an important subject matter. So Article 2, Clause 2. Is it Clause 2? No, Article 2, Section 2. So before you read that, so these are the powers of the President of the United States of America that's designated in the Constitution. That's the Constitution. I want to make it clear. The Constitution of the United States of America is de jure law. Article 6 makes it clear that there are other aspects 
of the Constitution other than the seven organic articles. Islam. Is that clear? Islam. Uh, including the Articles of Confederation, which is mentioned in Clause 1, including treaties, including laws passed by Congress that are in continuity and not in conflict with the Constitution. So, so all of those things are what you call the constitutional code, constitutional law. Islam? Islam. Islam. All right, so Article 2. Constitution, Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2. He shall have power by and with the advice and consent of the Senate to make treaties. We will stop right there. So he has the power, the president has the power to negotiate treaties. The most powerful man, single individual in the United States of America, holding the highest office, he can negotiate treaties, but only with the consent, about the Congress, of the Senate. He needs the Senate to negotiate a treaty with a foreign power. He can't do it by himself. Wow. So how can a man that never even held the office register the United States of America, a sovereign entity, without the, I mean, the jury, the jury do this, without, the, without a Congress, and without the president. The president himself don't even have the power to do that. Y'all most follow me? It's long. You see, Moors will study backwards. They study backwards. You're supposed to start at the prophet. And with things that the prophet reference, you're supposed to study those things. The Constitution is something that's referenced replete throughout the prophet's literature. That's right. Then you study the Constitution. You study the prophet's literature, the Moors' literature. You study the Constitution. Then you start studying things outside of the Constitution. You start wow. studying case laws. You start sure. studying, you know, uh, congressional acts. You start studying, um, you know, uh, 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 different legal procedures and processes and jurisprudence and all these other. You start blossoming and, and branching out from there. You can go into divine law. You can go into, but you you should start with a solid foundation because these other things will lead you into confusion. Wow. So where you would, you know. We're going to continue because we're going to start ironing it out when we need to. So where, where did I leave off at? So we, we covered our point. Just go, go to the portion where it goes to the um, ambassador. Yeah, to make treaties provided two-thirds of the senators present concur. And he shall nominate and by and with the advice and consent of, this, of the Senate shall appoint ambassadors. So stop right there. You see, the Europeans that came to these shores learned a lot. They did not just leave the land that they came from, take the exact same system of government, and then come over here and, and just start a new one and just rename it. That's not. This is not what these Europeans did. That's right. They studied governments ancient as well as contemporary. They studied the laws that they were living amongst in their system of government. And they took the pieces most pleasing to them. To right. form what you call the United States Constitution with the assistance of the Moors that were over here in the West. As long. So they knew having an executive ruler like a king, a monarch, somebody in that position, the corruption and the abuse of power that would take place. So they created checks and balances in the Constitution. They were going back and forth, like, no, nah, this needs to be in here. No, it doesn't. They were looking at different things that they could put together. And they came up with, nah, the president, he need to go through the Senate to get this done. He need to go through the Senate to get that done. So that corruption wouldn't exist. So that one man wouldn't be able to give away the sovereignty of the entire United States of America and all the citizens there running. And all the property and all the wealth. Working. So they were trying to protect future generations. So they, so, again, an ambassador, a person to be appointed an ambassador, Benjamin Franklin had to go through this process where he had to be recommended by the president at the time, and then he had to be confirmed by the Senate. That's making sense? Yeah. So where he get all this power from? <laughs> Y'all boys following me? It's long. So let's continue, because I want to get to her response as well before we run out of time. I don't want to make this particular portion a two-part. I want to get back to teaching the laws that freed us. And, um, but I think this is good. This is a good dialogue. And I, and, I, and I definitely want to encourage more people who are watching videos, who have questions, who may not agree with some of the things that we say, to, you know, post in the comment section. And, um, you know, this is not a, 
attacking the sister. She seems to be a very intelligent person. Just to be on this page of knowing you are more and, and, and knowing your illustrious history and having a, 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 a craving to learn that makes you a more intelligent person in my book than 99% of our people with, with all these education and doctorates and this and that. They don't know who they are. Well, you understand? Right. So the sister's on the path. She's on the right path. But you know, as, as, as a brother and as a sheep, you know, it's my duty to, you know, give her the right information. So that wow. she can choose to do with that what she will. It's wrong. Life. So she, so um, I, I continue, I say, I think there is a little confusion. I'm happy to further elaborate, but the United States of America was and is a de jure government. Remember, they have a constitution, you know, it was, you know, ratified, et cetera, et cetera. They, they represented them, they made it the government. The Moors were the ones that recognized their sovereignty. You see, this is the issue with a lot of Moors too, is that, so you want to purport that you have a Moorish government. Fine, that's fine. But when you, when in terms of navigating international intercourse, and I'm not talking about something biological, intercourse is a, is a term that's utilized talking about nations dealing with one another. You have to be recognized. It's fine. <coughs> Recognition is a part of sovereignty and nationhood. If, they, if, if, if another nation doesn't recognize your sovereignty, what's to stop them from crossing your borders? What's to stop them from claiming your land? It's the recognition. Either that, if that nation don't recognize you, at least you have allies that will force that nation to recognize you. Recognition is an important aspect to sovereignty, to international politics. So you want to delegitimize the nation that's the most recognized nation probably on the planet Earth, probably in human history. But you want to purport that you have the all of this authority when you're not recognized by anyone. You see, the Prophet Abu Ali was a genius. He incorporated the Moorish Scientific of America as a nation within the United States of America. So it's like, like, like how the young cats say, we, we get to live off of that clout. We get to live off the clout of the United States of America because you can't invade Moorish sovereignty because is protected under the constitutional fold. Whether a European soldier like your fez or he don't, is his job once he take that oath, once he don that uniform, once he becomes an officer within the military ranks to protect you. Islam? Islam. There was a, just a just, just little uh, uh, anecdote. There was a case in one of the Caribbean islands, I, I was just reading an article about this morning, this European guy from the United States of America. He took his family on vacation. Uh, he claimed that one of the maintenance workers. Yeah, I've I seen this. You, you seen it? I think uh, he blamed the death of somebody on a maintenance worker, right? No, no, no. He, he claimed the maintenance worker himself. He got a knock on the door. The maintenance worker said he had to come in and fix the sink. And then he allegedly pulled out a knife, according to the European. So he pulled out a knife, and then, you know, they charged the European with uh, uh, manslaughter. They charged him with manslaughter. But they let him go. But then the community within the island, I don't know if it was Antigua, I can't remember the exact island, but uh, they were so outraged that, you know, and they put up, you know, so much of an uh, issue yeah. about it that, the, that the, the representatives of their government started to put pressure to get the guy... Um, Back there. Extradited yeah. back. And then now, again, he has a nation of people. He has representatives in government who wrote, who wrote the Justice Department on his behalf to, to advocate for him and fight for him when he goes back over there to face trial. That's nationality. How you gonna pull that off, Mr. Moore? Mrs. Moore? <laughs> when your brother or sister's accused of something, what are you gonna do? What representatives are you going to contact that's going to aid in your defense? Islam? Islam. See, we have to really become fully disillusioned because we became disillusioned in one aspect in terms of us being Negro, black, and colored. But then there's this whole fantasy about what it is to be a Moor, about what authority and power that Moors hold. Many ancient people's lands were invaded and taken. Many ancient peoples 
were put into slavery and forced to serve another nation. And the wealth of their nation became the wealth of the conqueror. Many nations of people had their women enslaved and raped throughout human history. The only distinct difference why Allah sent us our prophet because we were taking our nationality and our knowledge of ourselves and our divine creed was taken away from us, taking us off the natural course and the natural path. But getting back to the, to the, to the, to the lesson at hand, I digress. The United States of America is de jure because it derives its authority from the Constitution and Moors were the first to recognize the USA as de jure, see the Treaty of Peace and Friendship. Okay, so that was about the whole diatribe I went into earlier. So Lincoln was operating under the legitimate or de jure constitutional government. He was, in that, he was assassinated before the United States created a corporate entity to use for international business in 1871. I was assuming that she was referencing, you know, the various different United States of America, you know, the corporate entity, et cetera, et cetera. I just made an assumption that that's what she was referencing. Um, the incorporating of the more, the, the, the incorporating of the United States of America. And that's the only incorporation that I know of. Um, and certainly not the government being incorporated and operating out of a foreign nation. Okay, so I don't have to get into the, um, the other aspects of it. So, okay, so... This was her response, of which I didn't respond to. So I'm going to take this time now to respond to that. Um, I used this, the previous amount of time I was elaborating, and now I'm going to respond to her last um, comment that I didn't get an opportunity to. Greetings, and thanks for responding respectfully. This is her to me. I'm referencing the corporate construct that Ben Franklin registered in France, 1754. Now, again, I, as I said, I did research on this. Maybe the sister Jackie Archer, she could send uh, you know, us an email or something like that with wherever her sources pertaining to that. I found no such information. And I think a lot of times, like say you, you, you buy a book from a mall, you order a book and they don't really give you citations, or you know, a mall may say something to you and it sounds good, but you don't have a particular source for it because I, I searched high and low to find, to find uh, such, such a, um, a document. No such document uh, turned up. But she says it was it was established to take of the service contracts for the union that was to take place. The union would become the United States Republic. All right. So actually, I'll be back track because there was some, something that I missed. There. So what's the problem with this sentence right here? She's saying I'm referencing the corporate construct that Benjamin Franklin registered in France, 1750. A corporate construct or construct? Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I don't want nobody's in the bed. <laughs> give, give, give it to me, man. What, 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 what's the problem with that? What she, uh, you just said corporate contract? I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it again. Point. Oh. Eight. Okay. It's long. Uh, I'm yeah. referencing the corporate construct that Benjamin Franklin registered in France 1754. Now, the grand she gave you the biggest hit in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So if you don't get this, it's a, it's a big problem. Gave it to you. That's about to go around the world. What did he just say to you? 1754. Exactly. Yeah. But why is 1754 problematic? Because it's not correlating with the time frame. Talking about what? Yeah. Give me more. Give me more. You're right, but give me more. The timeline of what? Of slavery? No. So you're talking about the constant. You gotta think, man. What's no. happening during this? What's 1754? What's happening during this time period? What happens a little bit later? Well, what you, like, what this, what are you talking about? Uh, American Revolution? Yes, this is prior to the American Revolution, yeah. which means. Come on, Mo, you're almost there, Mo. Walk with me, Mo. You're almost there, Mo. <laughs> American Revolution. It happened in 1754. When is the American Revolution? Okay, it's, uh, 17, like 1774, 1775. Okay, okay. The 1770s, all right. What was it fought over? Why were they fighting? But even deeper than that, why were they fighting? For their for they freedom. For their freedom. For their freedom to what? To be independent. To be an independent... Nation. Nation. So that means 
If this happens, if the corporation happened almost 20 years, or over 20 years, before America fought in a war to become a nation, how could America be incorporated as a nation uh -huh. in 1754? Wrong. That's even before the Articles of Confederation. That's, wrong. That's even before the Articles of Association. Association. Yeah. The 13 colonies are not a union. They are not together. They operate under charters. And stuff like they that. operate no charters from, from European powers. They were, they were already under Europe. England, France, you know, Germany, ETC. The, var the various different, um, well, the Magna Carta, that's 1215. That's centuries, centuries ago. And that's taking place in Europe. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the documents that was looked at as a basis for forming the Constitution. Because the Magna Carta was the first document to limit the right, the, the powers of the monarch, the king. You understand? So that was one of the documents by which the founding fathers hold to as a basis for the Constitution. You don't see? So you have you have one argument, you have one, and this is what happens. When more discover one side of an extreme, they automatically jump to the other side. So they find out that Moors took part in the United States of America. Oh, Moors was the one that, that created the Constitution. They made they wrote every line of the Constitution. They told all these Europeans that they were just students and stuff like that. The Europeans, they just signed their signature and the Moors just handed them a government. You know what I'm saying? Then the European on the other end is saying, oh yeah, well, this is just us white folks that came over here and formed the government and all Negroes were brought over here as slaves. And, but the truth is, it's somewhere in the middle. Uh, that, that Moors took part not only in fighting against the United States of America on the outside with the indigenous population and different tribes, but there were Moors within the 13 colonies uh, that were fighting for and inside of the Europeans. For, that, 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 that were citizens under the same government as the Europeans. Wow. Okay? So their allegiance, again, was nationality based on your allegiance. True. So their allegiance was to the United States of America. Wow. And you could um, do the knowledge if you read into the Dred Scott case in one of the dissenting opinions that talks about the Moors' role within the, the, the 13 colonies. Y'all Moors still follow me? It's wrong. Did, did I lose anyone? Y'all still with me? Still with you. All right, so let's continue on to uh, what she was saying. So she said, it was established to take the service contracts for the union that was to take place, the union that will become the United States Republic. Okay, well, let's, let's go back a little bit. She's saying, she's aware of this because she's saying that this was supposed to have taken place to establish the union. Okay, so I'm going to read that sentence again. So I apologize, Jackie, because I, you know, I didn't get a chance to read it over again. Just, to get, just, just for clarity, she says, it was established to take out of the service contracts, and some of the, the language is a little hard to, you know, to, to make out. It says, it was established to take of the service contracts for the union that was to take place. So I'm assuming she means the union that was supposed to be formed. The union that would become the United States Republic. And according to a law, lawyer can't be president. The Articles of Confederation are still valid. Are they not? Well, again, of course, the Articles of Confederation are still valid. And this is an interesting point because what happens if something was to take place that was unconstitutional, but no action occurs? That's unconstitutional, but nobody takes any action. Exactly. Exactly. Does color of law have real life implications to it? Absolutely it does. We know the 14th Amendment is a color of the law, and at the end of the day, it's what's regulating the society. So, you know, the argument of, of you know, I won't even get into that, whether a, a, a lawyer could be president or not, because during the time of Abraham Lincoln, and I, I'm not sure if the, the sisters, you know, because again, timelines and, and sequence of events is important. Could a lawyer not be a president? I think what she's referencing is either she's referencing the, um, the, the title of nobility aspect to it, 
or she's referencing um, just being affiliated with the Barrister Association. These are the two common arguments. And back then it was lower. Well, that's, that was what I was getting ready to get into. My bad. This is in reference to, now we're talking, that's what I'm saying, about timelines is important because if you can acknowledge that the United States of America was once de jour, then you have to pinpoint when it ceased being de jour. What event occurred? Who was, who was running the, the country at that time? How did the event occur? What were the, what were the surrounding events that precipitated, that created the, the atmosphere, the environment, the conditions by which the United States could go from de jour to de facto? You have to be able to answer those questions. So we're talking about, in reference to this video, the laws that freed us, what time period? In terms of us being coming free, 1865 time period, oh, yeah. which again is a time period that's referenced by the Prophet Nobu Ali. Oh. So, the Bar Association, when was it founded? Hmm. When, when, were, when were attorneys members of the Bar, lawyers members of the Bar? The 20th century, man, the 1900s. Somebody can Google that. I'm going to keep going because I don't want to. But if anybody finds out, you know, just Google bar, bar Association or whatever, History Bar Association, and you should be able to get a link on that. All right? So we can be precise. But that's why I was going to do this course, because they'd be like, oh, you're a member of the bar. During the time of the Organic Constitution, there was no bar. No. So Abraham Lincoln being president and being a lawyer, that wouldn't be a conflict. That would not be a conflict. There's no law that says this particular profession that we acknowledge that exists in the United States of America, if you work this profession, you can't be president of the United States of America. There's no such law. But you know, I mean, the sister, she's welcome in the comments, she, she can you know, present whatever documentation, but I would just ask that it be something that you know, we could re research, because as the prophet teaches us in the, in the Moorish Quran, man knows not by being told. So, so you know, these are, these are some of these claims, I, weren't, I wasn't able to uh, value or invalidate them because these are not even claims that are written about. You know, um, at least we're saying the United States, the 14 members are unconstitutional. You can find literature on it. You can find websites on it. You can find some type of information on it. But this particular, um, these particular suggestions, I didn't find anything on it. So let's let's move on because it's we got we got we got quite a bit more. I don't got much time. What's that? No, you got the American Bar? Yeah, that's the American Bar Association. Okay, well, what was year was that? Um, 1878. Okay, so that's the late 17th. Lincoln's already assassinated. So that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's fine. <laughs> could you find, could you look up to, just for precision, when was the act requiring lawyers to, to pass the bar? You know what I mean? Because I think that's more what I'm referencing. But. Yeah, I, got, I got all the information in the house, too. Yeah, that's what I'm... Uh, it was a congressional act that requires that you know people be members of the Bar Association to practice law in the United America. Just like it was a congressional act requiring medical doctors to, to, to have a license to um, to practice medicine. You know, it was a law that was passed. So she, so she states, according to a law, okay, we, we went over that. So she cites a case. She said US versus Wheeler, 1920 case, they were used. So when you look up this particular case, let's see if I still have it open. So that case is actually referencing a kidnapping case. I think that she wanted to reference the U.S. versus Wheeler 1978. The U.S. US versus Wheeler 1920, that's 254 U.S. 281. And um, the United States versus Wheeler 1978 was 435 U.S. 313. So you had one that was a kidnapping case, which I don't think is really relevant. I don't think that she was talking about that unless she had a specific thing the judge said. I don't, I don't know how she would tie that in, but I would think more relevant to the topic and what we deal with would be the United States versus Wheeler, which was a tribal sovereignty case, mm -hmm. all right? And in that case, the uh, defendant had appealed because he was found guilty of a crime in tribal court. And that same crime, he was tried in a, a state court, and he tried to argue double jeopardy. 
saying like, you know, you can't, you can't try me twice. But the court wound up um, trying him twice. The, the Supreme Court affirmed the lower court's decision and he just had to eat it in both cases. He had to take it, you know. That's the thing because, all right, well, your tribal punishment between your people, that's between y'all. But when it comes to this constitution, and we already know what the Supreme Law of the land is, we already understand the hierarchy and all that. Like, you know, uh, tribal governments on American soil is not going to trump or, or supersede the sovereignty of the United States of America. Like Jay Z said in his song, your arm's too short to box for God. Like we're not in a position where you can do anything about it. You know, in terms of in terms of physical nature, and it was the Moors, not Indians. It was the Moors that recognized the sovereignty of the United States of America. So, at the end of the day, if you recognize their sovereignty, that's, that's all, all it takes is one time, one shot. Oh. And the Moors were advocates, and, and not only did they recognize the sovereignty of the United States of America, they put the United States of America on with the Barbary powers. Tripoli, Tunis, you know, it wasn't just the Kingdom of Morocco. And, and they were able to get different connections in Europe and all of that off the clout of the Moors. So the prophet did the reverse when he came on the scene. Oh yeah, so y'all Moors is a superpower? All right, well, we Europeans gonna get good with y'all, we gonna get up under y'all so we can get certain things popping. Yeah, we'll pay you whatever we gotta pay you, blah, 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 blah. And they got up under us, they got our protections, and they were able to get they was able to get lit off of that. Huh. And then the prophet did the same thing. He was incorporated into the United States of America. Now, he's under the protections of the United States of America. And, and, and our people are under the protections of the U.S. It's long. All right, so that Willa case, you know, I, I'm thinking that's what she was referring to. But um, we're going to keep reading. Lincoln assassination was a result of him bankrupting that corporation in France. His knowledge of the coup Ben and them was caused was doing caused him his life. All right, so in terms of Lincoln's relationship with France, so let's, let's let's touch on that first. Lincoln, as you know, in the Civil War, it wasn't just a domestic war. There were foreign soldiers fighting on American soil. That's right. France was one of the nations that was involved and it, it aided. In supplying the Union with weapons and finances to, to, to be able to, um, you know, continue to fight this war. So, United States, so, so the United States of America, the de jure, versus the Confederation, the United States has a working relationship with France. So she claims that it was his knowledge of some bankruptcy or bankrupting a corporation that was incorporated in 1754 um, was the reason for his assassination. Well, I'm going to have to say no, that, that wasn't the reason for his assassination. The reason for his assassination was, you know, cleared out, and, uh, uh, made clear through the prophet in the first, second, and third forms. His reason for assassination was because not only did he free the so-called Negro, his objective was to compensate the so-called Negro, give them money, um, give them land, you know, um, federal protections and right. that what would happen and he was taking away the property of the southerners who economy was predicated upon slave labor that's right so the very act of removing that which they utilized to make money from their possession was enough for them to want to kill president lincoln it was economics, she's correct on that, but it was domestic economics, not foreign economics. The French ain't come over here and assassinate Lincoln. That was John Wilkes Booth. Mm -hmm. That was the Southern Democrats, okay? That's right. That were involved in the assassination of Lincoln. And that wanted him dead because of his actions in freeing the so-called, well, freeing the slaves, us as prisoners of war, and as well as Europeans and whoever else was held in bondage during this time. And again, taking the slave master's property. So he was, I guess you can say legit in the fact that he was the jury in his actions. Now the claim that Lincoln was the jury in his actions, hold on, let's look at that word de jure first. Yeah, that's probably what we should do. De jure means. So it says, according to rightful entitlement or claim, by right, but if you let's let's do it in law, let's say in law. Probably. 
We got five minutes, so we're going to wrap this up. You working, Mo? So it's Latin, it means legitimate, lawful, as a matter of law. So for Lincoln's actions to be de jure, there has to be a de jure government. It has to be a lawful government, a rightful government, for his actions to be de jure. Uh -huh. Make sense? Yeah. He was trying to restore their heirs back to their estate, 40 acres and a mule, and preserve the union between them and the Moroccan Empire. I don't think the, the, the latter part of what I just read, I don't, I don't agree with that, but to some extent you might make the argument that he was trying to restore, restore the cause in a state, but again, when you were just, if you're just looking at Leviticus 25.10, it was like it was the right thing to do, you know? The United States of America had benefited from slavery, slavery was tearing the nation apart. What's the best way that we could deal with slavery that is humane, that is, you know, um, respects the Constitution, and you know is in line with the Constitution, so he had to compensate the slave masters because the Constitution said you can't take your property, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he had to take all these considerations into account and compensate in the form of slaves and getting us on our feet so that we could be self-sufficient was the righteous thing to do. You know. But as we can see, Ben and them wasn't having it. Now this is Lincoln is assassinated in the year 1865. Benjamin Franklin is long dead. He's not even in the picture yet. There are those who took an oath to adhere to the continuation of the Inquisition against the Moors. That's in fact Wolver Street Clothing. That's the Little Red Riding Hood story. The de facto government, which there is, there is a de facto gov um, government in place in terms of you know how they're operating. I want to say the government's de facto, but how they're operating. They're operating um, under color of law. Looks very much like the de jure one, but something is off. It's dressed like grandma, but it's not grandma. Okay, so, um, so just to, to kind of sum it up, or what I'm saying is Benjamin Franklin would not have the authority to, um, according to the Constitution of the United States of America, would not have the authority to register the United States sovereignty to another government. He doesn't have that power. So even if he did it, even if we take for, this, for the argument that what she said is 100% right and exact, you know, he did it, he incorporated it, is that a de jure act? Is that, is that something that was done in accordance to the Constitution? And if it was not, we go back to the Supremacy Clause, anything to the contrary, not withstanding. Not withstanding. And with that, boys, I say it's law and peace. Peace. Oh.